from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello and uh, welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress, and I'm thrilled to be welcoming you here today to celebrate 100 years of Hebrew poetry uh, with our great, great reader, Peter Cole. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words before I introduce uh, the chief of the uh, African and Middle East Division, uh, Mary Jane Deeb. Uh, I'd like to thank Mary Jane and thank Peggy Perlstein, uh, who runs the Hebraic section and who will get up to introduce uh, Mr. Cole for putting this program together. I'd like to thank Peter Cole himself for his hard work getting here. Um, he and I both came down uh, from uh, New York uh, recently, uh, and I'm happy to be here myself. Um, the Poetry and Literature uh, Center has done a lot of work with the African and Middle Eastern Division uh, co-sponsoring programs. I'm proud to say that we have a series called Conversations with African Poets and Writers. And our next uh, event is actually coming up this Wednesday uh, in this very room. Ana Mulago will be here. Uh, so if you are interested, please come. Uh, it's at noon. Uh, if you want to find out more about the events that we do, uh, you can go to www.loc.gov slash poetry uh, and sign up for our listserv. Uh, we have a Friday event as well. But this is a great kickoff to our week of Ahmed uh, co-sponsored readings. The first time we've done anything with the Hebraic section. and. A, a, a great way to not only celebrate uh, our partnership, but also to celebrate uh, the great exhibit that this uh, event came out of. So without further ado, let me introduce Mary Jane Deeb, and uh, she will tell you more about uh, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I would like to welcome you to the African and Middle Eastern Division's reading room. Um, I'm Mary Jane Deeb, and I'm delighted to uh, be able to, uh, to host you in our room for what promises to be a fascinating uh, program. A big thanks to Rob Casper and to Peggy Perstein for having put together this program. And thank you, Peter, for having come all the way, despite the storms and everything, to be with us today. As most of you already know, our division is made up of three sections, the Hebraic, the African, and the Near East sections. Uh, we are responsible for materials from 78 different countries in the Near East, Central Asia, the Caucasus, as well as from the entire continent of Africa, North and Sub-Saharan. Our Hebraic and Judaica collections come from all over the world. We also serve these materials to patrons here in our reading room and organize programs, exhibits, and now we have the exhibit, and please go in and visit it, it's fabulous, uh, on the same floor on the Hebrew book. And uh, we also hold conferences and other activities that highlight our collections and that inform our patrons about the countries and the cultures these publications come from. And our presentation today is a case in point. Peter Cole is a poet and anthologist who will present a program on 100 years of Hebrew poetry. Poetry is an essential part of any culture. It is at the root of all civilization. There is no people without poetry. It is a quintessential way of communicating ideas, values, feelings that cannot be expressed in any other format. And here to introduce our guest today is Dr. Peggy Perstein, the head of the Hebraic section. Thank you, Mary Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to today's program with poet, translator, and anthologist, Peter Cole. We're so privileged to have Mr. Cole with us today, and I'm looking forward to hearing him read from his books and to hear more from him about Hebrew poetry, past and present. 
Peter Cole's most recent book, published by Yale University Press in April, is the poetry of Kabbalah, mystical verse from the Jewish tradition. He's authored three books of poems, the most recent of which is Things on Which I've Stumbled. His volumes of translations from Hebrew and Arabic include The Dream of the Poem, Hebrew Poetry from Muslim and Christian Spain, 950 to 1492, Aharon Shabtai's War and Love, Love and War, New and Selected Poems, Taha Muhammad Ali's So What, New and Selected Poems, 1973 to 2005, and he's also edited Hebrew Writers on Writing. In 2001, he wrote with Adina Hoffman, his wife, who's here today. 2011, he wrote with his wife, Adina Hoffman, Sacred Trash, the lost and found world of the Cairo Geniza. Peter Cole has received many honors for his work, including fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. He's received a National Jewish Book Award for Poetry, the Penn Translation Award for Poetry, the American Library Association's Brody Medal for the Jewish Book of the Year, and in 2007, he was named a MacArthur Fellow. He divides his time between Jerusalem and New Haven, co-edits the Jerusalem Publishing House Ibis Editions, and most currently teaches at Yale University. I'd like to let you know that tomorrow, same time, right here in our reading room, we have a program with Irvin Unger, who will be talking about the American art of Arthur Schick and he selected that topic because tomorrow is election day. Uh, if you'd like to be put on our email list for programs, please let us know afterwards, and you can also check our website for upcoming programs. Following Mr. Cole's reading and talk, we will welcome questions from the audience. This event is being videotaped for subsequent broadcasts on the library's website and other media. The audience is encouraged to offer comments and raise questions during the formal question and answer period that follows the poetry reading. But please be advised that your voice and image may be recorded and later broadcast as part of this event. By participating in the question and answer period, you're consenting to the library's possible reproduction and transmission of your remarks. And following the Q&A, we will have a book sale and signing in the rear of the room. And now, Peter Cole. Thank you, Peggy and Mary Jane. Thank you all for coming. Um, let me just make a little order here. Um, so today's program is a bit of a hodgepodge. Um, can you hear me OK back there? Yeah. And um, basically, we put it together. Um, Peggy sent me the list of items that are in the exhibit across the way there. And uh, 100 Years of Hebrew Poetry was the topic that was assigned. And, but we didn't agree on which 100 years of Hebrew poetry I would talk about. And since I translate from really post, early post-biblical work up until the present, I've put together a program that ranges over the history of Hebrew poetry all together, in my secret tally, there will be 100 years of Hebrew poetry. But it's going to jump all over the place. The organizing principle is also kind of, uh, let's say, eccentric. I've tried to pick poems that I've translated or written myself, in one case, um, that match something in the exhibit. But usually the correlation between, or not always, but often the correlation between the item in the exhibit and the poem will, let's say, be a little oblique. Okay, so that will keep everybody on their toes. I don't know how many of you have seen the exhibit, but I'll describe briefly the item in question so you can also go look at it afterwards. Um, the, first, the first thing I'm going to read is based on a, um, an item that is 17th century, I believe. Let me see what we have here. Um, Right, it is a Latin treatise by a 17th century Belgian philosopher 
who is writing about the fact that Hebrew is often considered in Hebrew literature and Christian literature also um, the language that Adam and Eve spoke, the, most, the natural language of mankind. And therefore, and here's one of the kind of curious things among many curious things you're about to hear, um, therefore, this Belgian philosopher thought that because it's the natural language, it could be used to help the hearing impaired learn to speak. And in this book that uh, is on display uh, across the way, uh, he has diagrams of where all the Hebrew sounds are made in the throat and in the mouth. This Belgian philosopher was a mystic or was interested in Jewish mysticism. And lo and behold, it turns out that the, one of the earliest Jewish mystical texts from approximately, we don't know when, approximately the second century CE, the common era, possibly up to the ninth century, a book called The Book of Creation or The Book of Formation. This book deals explicitly with the sounds of Hebrew, where they are in the mouth and in the throat. And the notion behind it all is that this is a kind of mystical book of Genesis. When God wanted to create the universe, he did it by combining two basic things. First, 10 primal channels of, of creation, which are based on the Pythagorean numbers. He combined those with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Those two things, the letters and the numbers together, was enough to create an entire universe. And that is that power of letters, of the Hebrew letter in particular, but some Jewish mystics would say all letters of all alphabets, that runs through the heart of Jewish mysticism and even through normative Judaism to a certain extent. So I'm going to start with an excerpt from this book of creation, Sefer Yitzirah, also can be translated as the book of formation. And in reading, and when I first went to translate it, I thought of uh, Ezra Pound has a comment in a, a letter to a younger poet at one point. And he says that the poet's primary task is to build a world. And in this mystical book, this is God's primary task, is to build a world and man imitates God by doing the same. So it's pretty strange, but this is what it sounds like. Probably written in the land of Israel or some people think in Babylonia. Again, we don't know. 32, through 32 hidden paths of wisdom, Yah, the Lord of hosts, engraved his name, the Lord of Israel, living God and King of the world, merciful, gracious God Almighty, on high and dwelling in eternity. His name is holy and he is sublime and created his world out of three words, Sefer, Sfar, Sipur, letter, limit, and tail. Ten spheres of restraint, whose measure is ten without end, a depth before and a depth behind, a benevolent depth and a depth that harms, a depth on high and a depth below, an eastern depth, a depth to the west, a northern depth and a southern depth, the single Lord and faithful master reigning over all, from the dwelling of his sanctity into eternity. Ten spheres of restraint, the sight like lightning, their reach without end, and his word within them runs and returns, his speech they pursue like a storm, and before his throne they bow, ten spheres of restraint, their end contained in their beginning, their beginning within their end, like coals in a lambent flame. For the Lord is one, and there is no other before one. What would you number? Twenty-two letters to start with. He engraved, quarried, and weighed, exchanged, and combined, and with them formed all of creation and all that he was destined to fashion. Twenty-two letters carved through voice, quarried in air, and fixed in the mouth in five positions. Certain sounds in the throat, certain sounds on the lips, certain sounds against the palate, and others against the teeth, and others still along the tongue. Twenty-two letters fixed like a wheel in a wall with 231 doors. The wheel whirs back and forth and the sign bearing its witness is no good is greater than oneg, pleasure. No evil greater than nega, plague. How did he combine, weigh, and exchange them? 
Aleph with all and all with Aleph, Bet with all and all with Bet. Over and over and on again, through 231 gates with every creature and also speech issuing from a single name, he created substance from nothing, from absence, making what there is. He hewed tremendous columns out of air that can't be grasped, combining, exchanging, and fashioning all of creation and every locution within a single name. And the sign bearing its witness is 22 longed for things in a single body bound. From here on in, consider what a mouth can't utter and what the ear can't hear. So that's a kind of a mystical opening to go with this book on how Hebrew can help the uh, hearing impaired. Um, if there's a theme apart from the correlation of what I'm going to read, apart from the correlation to the exhibit, it's I'm trying to read you things that give you an ex a sense of what it is that Hebrew can do and has done over history, especially when Hebrew is pushing its own limits, going to the very end edge of what Hebrew had done before that. So in a sense, we'll see Hebrew pushing the envelope. The next poem I want to read, um, jump far ahead into the 10th century. Uh, these are vastly different periods of Jewish history. Um, now we're going to go to Muslim Spain, period of Muslim Spain. Muslims ruled in Iberia, created a kind of renaissance where Cordoba was the equivalent, the rival of Baghdad in the east, and Jews for a certain period, century and a half, as Christians also lived w under Islamic rule with a, which, um, with a considerable measure of freedom, and they created their own literary renaissance, their own humanistic renaissance, very much in emulation of the Arab renaissance of the day. And in fact, so sort of deep-seated was the Hebrew and Jewish emulation of Islamic culture that Hebrew poets began seemingly out of the blue, although lately we've come to see, scholars have showed us how it's a much more organic process at work. Uh, Hebrew poets began in the middle of the 10th century to write very much in the Arabic style, copying everything that Arab poets had done for the last 100, 150 years, using their meters and their rhyme schemes and their tropes and their images. But the big difference, they were writing in Hebrew, the original language, the originary language, Jewish scripture, and they were using the entire sort of Jewish mythopoetic imagination. Those were the two big things. So they made this kind of perfect graft between Hebrew and Arabic that created a stunning poetry uh, I would argue that the best of it is, is, is as good as anything ever written in Hebrew, including the poetry of the Hebrew Bible. Right? And that poetry, as I say, emerged in the 10th century. One of the most surprising items of that Hebrew poetry emerged very, very early in the period, again, middle of the 10th century. Uh, there's a book, an artist's book, uh, that's on display here that is um, based on the Hebrew in my translation. And this is a, a, a poem that was, um, Peggy mentioned Sacred Trash, the book I wrote with my wife, Adina Hoffman. This is a poem that was actually found in this trash heap called the Cairo Geniza. I won't go into what that whole story will take too long. But basically, at a certain point, a scholar, this is in the 1930s, 1940s, a scholar found a piece of paper in this collection of documents, of sort of trash heap of documents in Cairo. And the paper was ripped down the middle, vertically. And on the right side, you could see there was the, um, or uh, there was the right, was it the right side of the poem or the left side? I can't remember now which one we had. Uh, we had the left side. We had the left side of the poem. Hebrew runs right to left. So we had the rhyme scheme of the poem. And on the top of the poem, there was a caption in Arabic, in Judeo-Arabic, which is Arabic written in Hebrew letters. And the last word of the caption was dunash. 
Dunash was the first really important poet of this Hebrew Renaissance in Spain. And there was enough of the poem on the left side, so a scholar reading it said, concluded that this was a poem about a wedding, and it was important because Dunash was the first, he was the real pioneer of this period. And he actually published half of this poem in the selected poems of Dunash that he published in about the 1940s. Lo and behold, 30, 40 years later, a scholar working in Jerusalem, looking at microfilm of this Cairo Geniza, was going through papers, doing his usual work, and he saw something that rang a bell. And he suddenly recognized that it was, he had the right side of the poem that was, had been torn vertically. I, I mean, it's a long story, I'm sort of uh, giving you the short version. He put them together and they fit perfectly and had been ripped in half somehow. And when he put them together, he was shocked. Several things shocked him. First of all, it turned out not to be a poem about a wedding, but a poem about a couple separating. That's not such a big shock. But it turned out not to be a poem by Dunash, the first poet. It turned out to be a poem by the wife of Dunash. So it was, you know, a poem by a woman. Well, that turned out to be the first poem ever discovered in medieval Hebrew literary history by a woman. It also turns out to be the only poem ever discovered in medieval literary history by a woman. And it also turns out to be much better than anything her husband ever wrote. And it's a very powerful little poem, very personal, it, it completely embodies the Arabic poetics of the day. And um, so I'm gonna read that for you now. Let me just find that, where did I put that? So the circumstance of the poem as we see it in the full version is apparently Dunash has been kicked out of Spain, told that it by the reigning Jewish patron of the day that he has to leave Spain. We don't really know what the circumstances are. But you can hear here in this poem the kind of refinement that this woman had, the sort of quiet bitterness in her voice, but also a real dignity, a real poise. And the poem is beautifully constructed. If you think of Islamic art of the period, the kind of symmetries and vividness, this poem is a kind of linguistic correlate to the visual aesthetic of Islamic art. Will her love remember her graceful doe, her only son in her arms as he parted? On her left hand, she placed a ring from his right. On his wrist, she placed her bracelet. As a keepsake, she took his mantle from him, and he in turn took hers from her. Would he settle now in the land of Spain if its prince gave him half his kingdom? And another poem from this same period, it's a period that's sort of popularly called the golden age of Hebrew literature. Um, the most famous poet of that period is a man named Yehuda Halevi. Um, next to Maimonides, he probably has the greatest name recognition of any medieval Jew. Um, he's not my favorite poet, I feel obliged to say, because everybody said, oh, Yehuda Halevi, he's so great. He is a great poet, but there are better. But he wrote some incredibly powerful poems. He's known mostly for his poems about wanting to leave Spain, leaving all that behind and making a pilgrimage to the land of Israel. Um, what I want to read to you now, however, though, is a riddle poem that he wrote. Again, this is a mode taken over from the Arab poets. Um, in the, the show here, there is a emblem riddle. It's a visual picture, which kind of contains a visual riddle. And then there's a poem uh, in rhyme, rather long, and you have to guess what the solution uh, to the riddle is. But the caption in the exhibit says that nobody has yet figured out the answer to the riddle uh, in that particular uh, picture. Um, this one is much simpler. It's only four lines long. And I want to see if anybody in the audience can guess 
what the answer to this one is. Okay, everybody paying attention? Okay. Evincing the infinite, the size of a palm, what it holds is beyond you, curious at hand. Okay, one more time. Evincing the infinite, the size of your palm, what it holds is beyond you, curious at hand. Any guesses? Evincing the infinite, the size of your palm, what it holds is beyond you, curious at hand. No, it's not, but the answer was someone else's hand, but that's not it. The mind, done? A mirror. a mirror. You have a hand mirror. You're holding the mirror in your hand. You're looking at it, evincing the infinite, that quality of a mirror. The size of your palm, what it holds is beyond you, the image of yourself now beyond you, curious, yourself looking at that at hand. Okay, he's got lots of those, and they're very lots of fun. He also has ones. There's a, a, a incantation, magic incantation bowls in the exhibit. Um, Halevi liked to write riddles on bowls too, or little exhortations to the eater, as he would sit down and look and see. There'd be a little poem written around the edge of his plate. Okay, um, there is also in the show several. Um, Several items related to the Zohar, the book of the Zohar. The Zohar is sort of the Bible of Jewish mysticism, composed, it used to be said by Moses de Leon, now it's pretty widely acknowledged that there were a number of authors of this book, it's not actually a book, it's many books put together. And um, it's a kind of mystical commentary on the Bible, it's a sort of loose way of describing it. Um, critic Harold Bloom, uh, once told me that he considers the Zohar a picnic with, to which all are invited, though they must bring their own lunch, which is to say there are endless m possibilities of meaning in this book. Um, what I'm going to read to you from, so there are two things in the exhibit. One is uh, one of the earliest editions, printed editions of the Zohar, uh, printed in Italy, and then there's one, a kind of a charming book, I think it's 17th, 18th century, there's a, a man who's 70 years old, and he's written out the Zohar himself in very, very big letters, and it says in the preface, so he can read it at night by candlelight, right, and his eyes are weak. Um, what I'm going to read to you from is a charm that appears in the Zohar, and it is a charm against Lilith. How many people here have heard the name Lilith? Have any idea who Lilith is? Okay, so just briefly for everybody, Lilith is sort of is uh, Adam's first wife, first headstrong wife, let's say. Um, for all kinds of reasons, they quarreled. One was she wanted to have intercourse uh, in, let's say, a more active manner than Adam had in mind. Um, and she was eventually banished. And ever since then, she roamed the world preying on fallen drops of semen people who masturbate, right, which is considered the sort of ultimate impurity. And uh, Harold Bloom calls her the, the muse of masturbation. And in particular in the Zohar, there is a passage, Zohar is full of pretty wildly erotic things. It's kind of shocking just how graphic uh, they'll get um, in their imaginative um, sort of conjurings of things, situations. Friday night, the Sabbath, is the time when pious couples are to have intercourse. Their sexual act is considered holy. It uh, has a direct, in Kabbalistic and Jewish mystical uh, writings and thought, it has a direct effect on the harmony in the heavens, on the harmony within God himself, with, between the male and the female aspects of the deity, right? So what we do below on earth, everything, including what we do on Friday night if we're a pious Jewish couple, um, affects God directly, almost in the sense of a kind of a hydraulic pressure uh, mechanism. Things are regulated, and that flow can be reversed from on high uh, down to below as well. Pious couples, when 
they are together on Friday night. Uh, if by chance they happen to want to have intercourse by lamplight, here's the connection to the, the candles, uh, the big letters of the candles in that exhibit, if they have, that's considered a sin, right? That's considered a transgression. And if they do that, and if semen is spilled, Lilith pounces and takes those drops of semen, and she can create demons from them and deform children and all sorts of things. She's considered basically um, a consort of Satan, of Samael, of the prince. She's considered the queen of the other side, the dark side. And in this, she is the dark correlate to the positive female force in Jewish mysticism known as the Shekhinah, which is a major uh, aspect of Jewish mysticism introduced especially around the 13th century when the Zohar was written. So this charm, this little eight-line charm, is to be recited by the husband before the couple engages in intercourse to keep Lilith at bay if she's in the room. It goes like this. Incantation against Lilith. Veiled in velvet is she here. Leave off, leave off. You shall not enter, you shall not emerge. It is neither yours nor your share. Return, return. The sea is swelling, its waves are calling. I hold to the holy portion. I am held in the holiness of the king. If you run out of things to say next time you're in that position, uh, you can think of that. Okay, also curious, one of the other items in the exhibit is uh, titled, One of the Most Curious Events in Jewish History, something like that. What did I do with my watch? Lost it, how are we doing for time? Okay. Um, and this event uh, that the exhibit refers to is, um, the coming of a man named Shabtai Tzvi, who was perceived in Judaism in the 17th century as a messiah. And he was, he never really wrote anything down. He had a beautiful voice, he sang, he was kind of a charismatic singer. Uh, pretty early on in his life, he got the sense, he was basically bipolar, scholars think. He began to perform strange acts. In the synagogue, he married, he performed a wedding ceremony between a Torah scroll and himself. He once showed up in the synagogue with a fish wrapped in a diaper. This was going to usher in the age of Aquarius, the Piscean age, um, or uh, one, one of, I don't remember actually which one it is now, but uh, he's going to usher in some astrological uh, age. And um, there was a man in, Ga in Gaza named Nathan, now known as Nathan of Gaza, who uh, was a Kabbalist, was a mystic, and he had heard about some of the strange acts of the Shabtai Tzvi, who had gone, was this, he was born in Salonika in the Ottoman Empire, he went to the land of Israel, and um, Nathan had the sense that this man was the Messiah, and Nathan also had a reputation of being a healer. And so Shabtai Tzvi, as far as we know, felt himself to be disturbed, sought out the help of this Jewish healer in Gaza, Nathan, and went to him for a kind of, for counsel. Strangely enough, Nathan said, there's nothing wrong with you, you're the Messiah. I mean, I'm joking and giving you sort of the vaudevillian version of it, but he basically said, you are not disturbed. In fact, you have prophetic powers. And he encouraged him to accept this role of himself as the Messiah. And eventually, Shabtai Tzvi at first refused, but he eventually did accept himself as the Messiah. And then he began doing even stranger things. He moved the Sabbath to a Monday. He changed a lot of the Jewish holidays. He permitted women to come to read from the Torah. He encouraged the performing of uh, sacrifices, biblical sacrifices that had been outlawed since the destruction of the Second Temple. He uh, encouraged the, um, sac the eating of the, um, of the fat of the lamb, which is in the biblical sacrificial rite, was considered for the priests only and had a kind of sexual symbolism. Uh, in other words, he did basically, the, he developed a doctrine of redemption through sin. 
not the observance of the Jewish commandments, but their violation is what would help bring on the redemption. And that has to do with a complicated theology, Kabbalistic mystical theology, that involves a descent into matter, into the lowest reaches of the universe to rescue sparks of original light that had been scattered in, a, in the catastrophe of creation. I can't go, go into, into all the detail there, but the basic uh, principle was through a descent into matter, into fleshly things, into the realm of the forbidden, redemption would come. And um, as you can imagine, the Jewish community, the normative Jewish community did not approve of this. And uh, they exerted pressure on the Ottoman authorities who eventually arrested Shabtai Tzvi, but not before a full third of world Jewry began to follow him. It was his, the legend of his acts and his miracles spread so far and wide throughout the Jewish world that a full third of world Jewry believed he was the Messiah. All right, that's a kind of number that's hard to compute. A third of world Jewry believed he was the Messiah. That means it was the largest messianic movement in Judaism since Christianity. So it was a huge deal. When he was arrested by the Muslim authorities in Turkey, he was under duress, forced to convert to Islam. But for Shabtai Tzvi, that was not a problem. Another transgression, the bigger the transgression, the more bang you get for your buck. He converted very happily. There are pictures, pictures, verbal pictures, uh, portraits drawn of him, you know, with a Torah, with a Quran in one hand, Hebrew prayer phylacteries, straps wrapped around his arm, sipping wine, uh, Muslim singing women, uh, Arab or Turkish singing girls all around him. He was having a grand old time. He was a kind of early postmodernist piling on all the identities and enjoying them all. Anyway, he died in exile, basically under a kind of house arrest. Problem was, what about all that third of world Jewry once he converted to Islam? What was gonna become of all them? Well, most of them obviously went back and said, no, they saw the error of their ways. Obviously, they were wrong to believe in him. They went back to Judaism. A few of them maintained a Jewish identity, but secretly believed that he was the Messiah and developed a whole um, sort of theology around that. The book that's in the exhibit is a prayer book from around the time of uh, Shabtai Tzvi about from within that community of Jews who stayed, who are still Jews, but who believe that this man is the Messiah. But there was a very small group of Jews who followed him into Islam. They converted completely to Islam in Salonika, and they became known as the Dunme. The Dunme is a Turkish word, just means apostate. And they developed a du complete double life. Outwardly, they lived as Muslims. They had Muslim names. They went to the mosque on Friday. They did everything that good Muslims do that, the Tur that Turkish citizens would do. But at home, they had Hebrew or Jewish names. They developed their own theology. They had their own prayer book. They had basically, and it, and it bore no relation to normal Jewish prayer books. They had their own hymn book. And for about 200 years, this went on. And it was only in the 20th century, due to the population transfers and complicated things, when that community of Donme began to break up, that their literature, which had been completely secret up until then, began to be known in the West. Scholars got hold of some of their prayer books. And it's only in the last 50 years that some of that stuff has been published. Now we have over 2,000 hymns by the Dunme, and they are weirder than weird. Uh, include some of this notion of transgression through sin. They would also engage in a spring festival of the lambs, the, the sacrifice of the lambs, and at that point it would be like a spring bacchanalia, there would be something known as the extinguishing of the lights, when after eating the ritual fat and the lamb, the lights would be doused and couples would exchange spouses. So, I mean, again, not what we were taught in Sunday school growing up uh, in New Jersey. Um, so I wanna read to you one hymn from, uh, from that, one of those prayer books. And this is uh, 
basically these Donmei were Jewish Muslims, or you could call them Muslim Jews. And you know, people are always wanting Jews and Arabs and Jews and Muslims to get together these days. This is not what they had in mind. So it goes like this. I have to find it, one second. I gave this one the title, The Valley of Ishmael. So it's in the second person, you, the poem is addressed to Shabtai Tzvi. He's already dead, but he's considered the Messiah. Through you will a blessing be brought to Israel through the secret of the Valley of Ishmael. For the Redeemer has come to restore through the secret of the Valley of Ishmael. He said, the Lord has heard his servant who has served. He who within him has dwelled through the secret of the valley of Ishmael. The letters hold the redemption. For the jubilee year is his foundation. Through sin he brought to sanctification. Through the secret of the valley of Ishmael. Tzvi, our teacher, is the redeemer. It's he who established the upper splendor. In primordial space in the shell's chamber, through the secret of the valley of Ishmael, these things are seen as though through a veil, and they are most abstruse as well. But in them, I have found the real through the secret of the valley of Ishmael. I want to jump just for, how are we doing with time? I seem to have completely lost my watch. Five minutes. Okay. So we'll do just a couple of modern poems. Um, in the exhibit, there is a, uh, an item that's titled, The First Hebrew Poem Printed in the United States. So I'm not going to read to you from the first or early Hebrew poetry printed in the United States. I'm going to read you from work by the last Hebrew poet in the United States. Of course, actually, there are others who have continued, but this is the last poet who was really considered a, an important poet um, who wrote powerful poetry. Maybe others will come along, but most people consider him at this point to be the last. Uh, his name is Gabriel Pryle, was. He died, he was born in 1911 in Estonia, he died in 1993, actually while visiting Israel, but he lived in New York almost his entire life. And um, he wrote, he just kept on writing in Hebrew. There was a group of Hebrew poets in New York, especially actually not just in New York, all around the United States. Uh, in my opinion, I think the opinion of others, uh, he was the best of them. Um, in this book, Hebrew Writers on Writing, he has, I have a piece, a prose piece of his um, that he wrote in Yiddish, which is all about how important the weather is for a poet. There are certain kinds of poets who can't say anything about how they feel without channeling it through a description of the weather. And in a certain sense, he saw himself as one of those. So here's a poem of his that deals to some extent with the weather. It's titled Gramercy Park in New York. Those of you who know that lovely little square there, Gramercy Park, and it goes like that, like this. Walking into that mild square is like refuting the fact of our chilly existence and the darker jobness of it. A kind of spring colors the surface of things. And even the past starts dispersing small smiles so that the women too are beautiful there. And the books open exactly to the place where the author is telling of a certain not quite sadness beyond a blue door. Um, maybe two more. One of my favorite, probably my favorite Israeli, contemporary Israeli poet, uh, is a man named Aaron Shabtai. I've translated quite a, Peggy mentioned, I translated quite a few of his poems, three or, three or four books. The last one is called Love and War, War and Love. Shabtai is, um, he's a kind of titanic force in contemporary Hebrew. He's reviled today because he's so sort of incendiary and he's almost kind of professionally provocative by design. He sees his role, he sees the poet's role 
as someone who's there to get under the skin of most readers. And uh, he's done this throughout his life. His poems are published, have been published for a long, long time in the pages of Haaretz, which is the major intellectual, serious newspaper in Israel. It's like the New York Times of Israel. Um, unlike the New York Times, it publishes a great deal of poetry and translation every weekend. So a lot of the poetry that's published in Israel doesn't just appear in little, little magazines or literary magazines like in America. Some of it appears on the pages of the major newspaper. So everybody reads these things um, all the time. And there was a period, particularly um, during the Second Intifada, when Shabtai was writing just ferocious political poems, absolutely ferocious, some of the best political poetry I've ever read in any language. And he was taking a tremendous amount of flack for it also. And so was the publisher of Haaretz, because every time he would publish one of these poems, angry letters to the editor would follow, even though it's a liberal newspaper. And the publisher s defended this poet all the time, saying, you know, he's 20 years ahead of his readership. One day they'll understand. So I'll read this one, which is very much about sort of the state of things in Israel around the year. It's written in 1998. Things have not gotten any better. They've only gotten worse, in my opinion. Um, but it's also very much a poem about the Hebrew language, which is another one of the themes of the exhibit, is the power of Hebrew, right? And so he is writing about what the political situation in Israel, as he sees it, has done to corrupt the language that he loves. Okay, I'll read this, and then I'm gonna read one other that goes back a little bit to the beginning of the century. This is called The Reason to Live Here, and I should say that the circumstances of this poem were such, Haaretz, this newspaper, had, there's a joke in Israel that the last person out of the country should turn the lights out at the airport, right? In other words, things are always getting so bad, it's assumed that sooner or later everybody will, everybody wants to leave. Sooner or later everybody will go, please turn the lights off when you leave. So they asked, they polled a bunch of writers in Haaretz, and they often do this, they have these kind of surveys, they ask a bunch of writers, what's your favorite book that you read in the last year, whatever, you know, sort of the normal questions. This one they asked him, what's your reason for staying in the country? Because a lot of people in Israel have other passports, or they could go, they could get jobs somewhere else. It's in the brain drain is very serious there. So he didn't answer that question directly. He answered it by wrote it, writing a poem called The Reason to Live Here. This country is turning into the private estate of 20 families. Look at its fattened political arm, at the thick neck of its bloated bureaucracy. These are the officers of Samaria. There's no need to consult the oracle. What the capitalist swine leaves behind, the nationalist hyena shreds with its teeth. When the governor of the Bank of Israel raises the interest rate by half a percent, the rich are provided with backyard pools by the poor. The soldier at the outpost guards the usurer who'll put a lien on his home when he's laid off from the privatized factory and falls behind on his mortgage payments. The pure words I suckled from my mother's breasts, man, child, justice, mercy, and so on, are dispossessed before our eyes, imprisoned in ghettos, murdered at checkpoints, and yet there's still good reason to stay on and live here, to hide the surviving words in the kitchen, in the basement, or the bathroom. The prophet Melampus saved twin orphaned snakes from the hand of his slaves. They slithered toward his bed while he slept, then licked the oracles of his ears. When he woke with a fright, he found he could follow the speech of birds. So Hebrew delivered will lick the walls of our hearts. And the last poem I want to read is in a very, very different vein. It's by a man named Avram ben Yitzchak, and um, he is he's considered a legend in the history of Hebrew poetry. I translated his collected poems, all 12 of them. And he lived in, um, and he was born in 1883, is it? Yeah, 1883, died in 1950. He, he published only 12 poems in his entire lifetime. Most of them in his 20s, and then wrote one in his 30s, I believe it was, one in his 40s, and then he fell silent. But these poems were just considered, they're sort of 
models for almost every Hebrew poet. And the last poem that he published is a poem in a certain sense, it's about a lot of things, but it's also about not writing, not speaking, what it is that words can and can't do, or what it is that he has to say and doesn't want to say or can't find the words for. So it's an incredibly powerful poem, especially when read alongside the fact that this man fell silent for the rest of his life after this. And you'll hear echoes of the New Testament here um, and all sorts of things. It's called Blessed Are Those Who Sow and Do Not Reap. Blessed are those who sow and do not reap. They shall wander in extremity. Blessed are the generous whose glory and youth has enhanced the extravagant brightness of days, who shed their accoutrements at the crossroads. Blessed are the proud whose pride overflows the banks of their souls to become the modesty of whiteness in the wake of a rainbow's ascent through the clouds. Blessed are those they who know their hearts will cry out from the wilderness and that quiet will blossom from their lips. Blessed are these, for they will be gathered to the heart of the world, wrapped in the mantle of oblivion, their destinies offered, unuttered to the end. There's my watch. Oh. <laughs> what How time is it? One o'clock. Okay, perfect timing. All right, thank you so much for giving us more than a hundred years of poetry, right. really a thousand years of poetry. So we got 10 times what we thought we were gonna get today. Any questions, please? Right. Yeah. So the question or the comment is that I read a poem, a riddle poem about the mirror we talked about, and the gentleman said that that kind of image is typical of colloquial Arabic, right, or the Arabic sort of right folk riddles. Yes, and so it's something that's very, very deep. It runs deep in Arabic culture. In fact, when you learn Arabic, as I've learned Arabic, that's the kind of thing you learn also because they're easy to learn because they rhyme too. And they're lots of fun. And they're also quite uh, magical in a lot of ways. Um, and it, it's testament to what I had said before of this, as opposed to the Shabbatean grafting of Muslim and Jewish things, the uh, Andalusian, Spanish, Iberian, grafting of Hebrew and Islamic or Arab style Arabic uh, culture uh, was deep. It ran very, very deep. I mean, the Jews of that period spoke Arabic as their mother tongue, right? That was their, that was their language. They did everything in Arabic. They dreamt in Arabic. They shopped in Arabic. They wrote all their philosophy. They wrote everything except for poetry and prayers in Arabic. Um, there's even the first Hebrew dictionary written in Babylonian, Baghdad, in the 10th century. It's, it's a rhyming dictionary for poets. And the writer writes in a preface, and he has a preface in Arabic and a preface in Hebrew. He tells the Hebrew poets, you should do everything in Hebrew, use it even in the bedroom. In other words, obviously they didn't use it in the bedroom, they're using Arabic. Um, but it should also be said that Hebrew, while it wasn't their mother tongue, wasn't some completely artificial thing because they learned it from the age of three. So these people also had Hebrew in them in a very, very deep way, particularly the Bible, all the rabbinic literature. So Hebrew was very natural for them, but Arabic, in a certain sense, ran even deeper. The question is, what, I read the poems in translation, could I comment on what is lost in translation? Of course, I think that nothing is lost. In fact, they're much better. Uh, 
Borges, Louis, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, has a, um, a comment in his uh, Elliot Norton lectures years ago, I think in the 60s, he gave them at Harvard, and he said, you know, after, I'm not talking about myself here, I'm talking about what he said, after one reads a good translation or spends a lot of time thinking about translation in a serious way, and then you return to the original, the original is always a little disappointing. <laughs> so I just answer that by way of, uh, you know, continuing the sort of theme of obliquity here. Um, but I know I truly, discussions of translation always begin in impossibility and the questions of loss. I don't think about loss, I think about pleasure. What are the pleasures of translation? What is gained in translation? Let's, let's say some of you had a halfway decent time today, like some, liked at least some of the poems, right? You got something, something that you wouldn't get probably because you don't read Hebrew. I mean, some of you might. But even some of you who read Hebrew might have seen some of these poems in a new light, right? And so for me, I'm really, I don't say that somebody, you know, translation requires a mixture of humility and presumption. We always like to talk about the humility. I'm reminded of the need to be, I'm humiliated by the need for humility all the time as a translator. The other side gets much less attention, but I think is actually much more ac in a much more active and valuable force in the world. So for me, that's sort of where I come down. Don't be intimidated by the fact that you're being filmed and recorded by Library of Congress. Uh, I wasn't, just a little. Anything else? No? Okay. Thank you so much, and thank you for helping us understand the exhibit across the hall, words like sapphires, 100 years of Hebraic at the Library of Congress, 1912 to 2012, in terms of all the poetry that's in the exhibit. So thank you very much. Hello, I'm Peggy Pearlstein, head of the Hebraic section at the Library of Congress. I'm standing in front of our exhibit, Words Like Sapphires, A Hundred Years of Hebraic at the Library of Congress, 1912 to 2012. At the end of our exhibit, we have a whole section on Hebrew poetry. And with us today on Monday, November 5, 2012, is poet and translator Peter Cole. He will be reading his English translation from the Hebrew poem, Will Her Love Remember Her? Remember, attributed to the wife of Dunash ben Labrat. Among the thousands of medieval Hebrew poems, this is the only one that seems to have been written by a woman. And now, Mr. Cole, Will Her Love Remember? So this is the only poem we have um, in the history of the Hebrew Middle Ages uh, by a woman. And um, it's from the middle of the 10th century and was written in southern Spain. Will her love remember his graceful doe, her only son in her arms as he parted? On her left hand, he placed a ring from his right. On his wrist, she placed her bracelet. As a keepsake, she took his mantle from him, and he in turn took hers from her. Would he settle now in the land of Spain if its prince gave him half his kingdom? This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.